Section 43 of The World as Will and Idea. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cynthia Moyer. The World as Will and Idea, Volume 1, by Arthur Schopenhauer. Translated by R. B. Haldane and J. Kemp. Fourth Book, The World as Will, Sections 69 and 70. Section 69. Suicide, the actual doing away with the individual manifestation of will, differs most widely from the denial of the will to live, which is the single outstanding act of free will in the manifestation, and is therefore, as Asmus calls it, the transcendental change. This last has been fully considered in the course of our work. Far from being denial of the will, suicide is a phenomenon of strong assertion of will, for the essence of negation lies in this that the joys of life are shunned, not its sorrows. The suicide wills life, and is only dissatisfied with the conditions under which it has presented itself to him. He therefore by no means surrenders the will to live, but only life, in that he destroys the individual manifestation. He wills life, wills the unrestricted existence and assertion of the body, but the complication of circumstances does not allow this, and there results for him great suffering. The very will to live finds itself so much hampered in this particular manifestation that it cannot put forth its energies. It therefore comes to such a determination as is in conformity with its own nature, which lies outside the conditions of the principle of sufficient reason, and to which, therefore, all particular manifestations are alike indifferent, inasmuch as it itself remains unaffected by all appearing and passing away, and is the inner life of all things for that firm inward assurance by reason of which we all live free from the constant dread of death, the assurance that a phenomenal existence can never be wanting to the will, supports our action even in the case of suicide. Thus the will to live appears just as much in suicide, Shiva, as in the satisfaction of self-preservation, Vishnu, and in the sensual pleasure of procreation, Brahma. This is the inner meaning of the unity of the Trimurtis, which is embodied in its entirety in every human being, though in time it raises now one, now another, of its three heads. Suicide stands in the same relation to the denial of the will as the individual thing does to the idea. The suicide denies only the individual, not the species. We have already seen that, as life is always assured to the will to live, and as sorrow is inseparable from life, suicide, the willful destruction of the single phenomenal existence, is a vain and foolish act for the thing in itself remains unaffected by it, even as the rainbow endures, however fast the drops which support it for the moment may change. But more than this, it is also the masterpiece of Maya, as the most flagrant example of the contradiction of the will to live with itself. As we found this contradiction in the case of the lowest manifestations of will, in the permanent struggle of all the forces of nature, and of all organic individuals for matter and time and space, and 
as we saw this antagonism come ever more to the front with terrible distinctness in the ascending grades of the objectification of the will so at last in the highest grade the idea of man it reaches the point at which not only the individuals which express the same idea extirpate each other but even the same individual declares war against itself the vehemence with which it wills life and revolts against what hinders it namely suffering brings it to the point of destroying itself so that the individual will by its own act puts an end to that body which is merely its particular visible expression rather than permit suffering to break the will just because the suicide cannot give up willing he gives up living the will asserts itself here even in putting an end to its own manifestation because it can no longer assert itself otherwise as however it was just the suffering which it so shuns that was able as mortification of the will to bring it to the denial of itself and hence to freedom so in this respect the suicide is like a sick man who after a painful operation which would entirely cure him has been begun will not allow it to be completed but prefers to retain his disease suffering approaches and reveals itself as the possibility of the denial of will but the will rejects it in that it destroys the body the manifestation of itself in order that it may remain unbroken this is the reason why almost all ethical teachers whether philosophical or religious condemn suicide although they themselves can only give far-fetched sophistical reasons for their opinion but if a human being was ever restrained from committing suicide by purely moral motives the inmost meaning of this self-conquest in whatever ideas his reason may have clothed it was this i will not shun suffering in order that it may help to put an end to the will to live whose manifestation is so wretched by so strengthening the knowledge of the real nature of the world which is already beginning to dawn upon me that it may become the final quieter of my will and may free me for ever it is well known that from time to time cases occur in which the act of suicide extends to the children the father first kills the children he loves and then himself now if we consider that conscience religion and all influencing ideas teach him to look upon murder as the greatest of crimes and that in spite of this he yet commits it in the hour of his own death and when he is altogether uninfluenced by any egotistical motive such a deed can only be explained in the following manner in this case the will of the individual the father recognizes itself immediately in the children though involved in the delusion of mistaking the appearance for the true nature and as he is at the same time deeply impressed with the knowledge of the misery of all life he now thinks to put an end to the inner nature itself along with the appearance and thus seeks to deliver from existence and its misery both himself and his children in whom he discerns himself as living again it would be an error precisely analogous to this to suppose that one may reach the same end as is attained through voluntary chastity by frustrating the aim of nature in fecundation 
or indeed if in consideration of the unendurable suffering of life parents were to use means for the destruction of their newborn children instead of doing everything possible to ensure life to that which is struggling into it for if the will to live is there as it is the only metaphysical reality or the thing in itself no physical force can break it but can only destroy its manifestation at this place and time it itself can never be transcended except through knowledge thus the only way of salvation is that the will shall manifest itself unrestrictedly in order that in this individual manifestation it may come to apprehend its own nature only as the result of this knowledge can the will transcend itself and thereby end the suffering which is inseparable from its manifestation it is quite impossible to accomplish this end by physical force as by destroying the germ or by killing the newborn child or by committing suicide nature guides the will to the light just because it is only in the light that it can work out its salvation therefore the aims of nature are to be promoted in every way as soon as the will to live which is its inner being has determined itself there is a species of suicide which seems to be quite distinct from the common kind though its occurrence has perhaps not yet been fully established it is starvation voluntarily chosen on the ground of extreme asceticism all instances of it however have been accompanied and obscured by much religious fanaticism and even superstition yet it seems that the absolute denial of will may reach the point at which the will shall be wanting to take the necessary nourishment for the support of the natural life this kind of suicide is so far from being the result of the will to live that such a completely resigned ascetic only ceases to live because he has already altogether ceased to will no other death than that by starvation is in this case conceivable unless it were the result of some special superstition for the intention to cut short the torment would itself be a stage in the assertion of will the dogmas which satisfy the reason of such a penitent delude him with the idea that a being of a higher nature has inculcated the fasting to which his own inner tendency drives him old examples of this may be found in the breslauer sammlung von natur und medizingeschichten september seventeen ninety nine page three hundred sixty three in bale's nouvelles de la republique des lettres february sixteen eighty five page one hundred eighty nine in zimmermann über die einsamkeit volume one page one hundred eighty two in the histoire de l'académie des sciences for seventeen sixty four an account by hutoin which is quoted in the sammlung für praktische ärzte volume one page sixty nine more recent accounts may be found in huffelands journal für praktische heilkunde volume ten page one hundred eighty one and volume forty eight page ninety five also in Nasse's Zeitschrift für psychische Ärzte, 1819, Part 3, page 460, and in the Edinburgh Medical and Surgical Journal, 1809, volume 5, page 319. In the year 1833, all the papers announced that the English historian, Dr. Lingard, had died in January at Dover of voluntary starvation. According to later accounts, it was not he himself, 
but a relation of his who died still in these accounts the persons were generally described as insane and it is no longer possible to find out how far this was the case but i will give here a more recent case of this kind if it were only to ensure the preservation of one of the rare instances of this striking and extraordinary phenomenon of human nature which to all appearance at any rate belongs to the category to which i wish to assign it and could hardly be explained in any other way this case is reported in the nuremberger correspondenten of the twenty ninth july eighteen thirteen in these words we hear from bern that in a thick wood near thurnen a hut has been discovered in which was lying the body of a man who had been dead about a month his clothes gave little or no clue to his social position two very fine shirts lay beside him the most important article however was a bible interleaved with white paper part of which had been written upon by the deceased in this writing he gives the date of his departure from home but does not mention where his home was he then says that he was driven by the spirit of god into the wilderness to pray and fast during his journey he had fasted seven days and then he had again taken food after this he had begun again to fast and continued to do so for the same number of days as before from this point we find each day marked with a stroke and of these there are five at the expiration of which the pilgrim presumably died there was further found a letter to a clergyman about a sermon which the deceased heard him preach but the letter was not addressed between this voluntary death arising from extreme asceticism and the common suicide resulting from despair there may be various intermediate species and combinations though this is hard to find out but human nature has depths obscurities and perplexities the analysis and elucidation of which is a matter of the very greatest difficulty section seventy it might be supposed that the entire exposition now terminated of that which i call the denial of the will is irreconcilable with the earlier explanation of necessity which belongs just as much to motivation as to every other form of the principle of sufficient reason and according to which motives like all causes are only occasional causes upon which the character unfolds its nature and reveals it with the necessity of a natural law on account of which we absolutely denied freedom as liberum arbitrium indifferentiae but far from suppressing this here i would call it to mind in truth real freedom i e independence of the principle of sufficient reason belongs to the will only as a thing in itself not to its manifestation whose essential form is everywhere the principle of sufficient reason the element or sphere of necessity but the one case in which that freedom can become directly visible in the manifestation is that in which it makes an end of what manifests itself and because the mere manifestation as a link in the chain of causes the living body in time which contains only phenomena still continues to exist the will which manifests itself through this phenomenon then stands in contradiction to it for it denies what the phenomenon expresses in such a case the organs of generation for example as the visible form of the sexual impulse are there and in health but yet in the inmost consciousness no sensual gratification is desired and 
although the whole body is only the visible expression of the will to live, yet the motives which correspond to this will no longer act. Indeed, the dissolution of the body, the end of the individual, and in this way the greatest check to the natural will, is welcome and desired. Now, the contradiction between our assertions of the necessity, of the determination of the will by motives, in accordance with the character on the one hand, and of the possibility of the entire suppression of the will, whereby the motives become powerless, on the other hand, is only the repetition in the reflection of philosophy of this real contradiction which arises from the direct encroachment of the freedom of the will in itself, which knows no necessity, into the sphere of the necessity of its manifestation. But the key to the solution of these contradictions lies in the fact that the state in which the character is withdrawn from the power of motives does not proceed directly from the will, but from a changed form of knowledge. So long as the knowledge is merely that which is involved in the principium individuationis, and exclusively follows the principle of sufficient reason, the strength of the motives is irresistible. But when the principium individuationis is seen through, when the ideas, and indeed the inner nature of the thing in itself, as the same will in all, are directly recognized, and from this knowledge an universal quieter of volition arises, then the particular motives become ineffective, because the kind of knowledge which corresponds to them is obscured and thrown into the background by quite another kind. Therefore the character can never partially change, but must, with the consistency of a law of nature, carry out in the particular the will which it manifests as a whole. But this whole, the character itself, may be completely suppressed or abolished through the change of knowledge referred to above. It is this suppression or abolition which Asmus, as quoted above, marvels at and denotes the Catholic transcendental change. And in the Christian Church it has very aptly been called the new birth, and the knowledge from which it springs, the work of grace. Therefore it is not a question of a change, but of an entire suppression of the character. And hence it arises that, however different the characters which experience the suppression may have been before it, after it they show a great similarity in their conduct, though every one still speaks very differently according to his conceptions and dogmas. In this sense, then, the old philosophical doctrine of the freedom of the will, which has constantly been contested and constantly maintained, is not without ground, and the dogma of the church of the work of grace and the new birth is not without meaning and significance. But we now unexpectedly see both united in one, and we can now also understand in what sense the excellent Malbranche could say, La liberté est un mystère, and was right. For precisely what the Christian mystics call the work of grace and the new birth is for us the single direct expression of the freedom of the will. It only appears if the will, having attained to a knowledge of its own real nature, receives from this a quieter, by means of which the motives are deprived of their effect, which belongs to the province of another kind of knowledge, 
the objects of which are merely phenomena. The possibility of the freedom which thus expresses itself is the greatest prerogative of man, which is for ever wanting to the brute, because the condition of it is the deliberation of reason, which enables him to survey the whole of life independent of the impression of the present. The brute is entirely without the possibility of freedom, as, indeed, it is without the possibility of a proper or deliberate choice following upon a completed conflict of motives, which, for this purpose, would have to be abstract ideas. Therefore, with the same necessity with which the stone falls to the earth, the hungry wolf buries its fangs in the flesh of its prey, without the possibility of the knowledge that it is itself the destroyed as well as the destroyer. Necessity is the kingdom of nature, freedom is the kingdom of grace. Now, because, as we have seen, that self-suppression of the will proceeds from knowledge, and all knowledge is involuntary, that denial of will also, that entrance into freedom, cannot be forcibly attained to by intention or design, but proceeds from the inmost relation of knowing and volition in the man, and therefore comes suddenly as if spontaneously from without. This is why the Church has called it the work of grace and that it still regards it as independent of the acceptance of grace corresponds to the fact that the effect of the quieter is finally a free act of will and because in consequence of such a work of grace the whole nature of man is changed and reversed from its foundation so that he no longer wills anything of all that he previously willed so intensely, so that it is as if a new man actually took the place of the old. The Church has called this consequence of the work of grace the new birth, for what it calls the natural man, to which it denies all capacity for good, is just the will to live, which must be denied if deliverance from an existence such as ours is to be attained. Behind our existence lies something else, which is only accessible to us if we have shaken off this world. Having regard not to the individuals according to the principle of sufficient reason, but to the idea of man in its unity, Christian theology symbolizes nature, the assertion of the will to live in Adam, whose sin, inherited by us, i.e. our unity with him in the idea, which is represented in time by the bond of procreation, makes us all partakers of suffering and eternal death. On the other hand, it symbolizes grace, the denial of the will, salvation in the incarnate god who as free from all sin that is from all willing of life cannot like us have proceeded from the most pronounced assertion of the will nor can he like us have a body which is through and through simply concrete will manifestation of the will but born of a pure virgin he has only a phantom body this last is the doctrine of the Ducetai, i.e. certain church fathers, who in this respect are very consistent. It is especially taught by Appel, against whom and his followers Tertullian wrote. But even Augustine comments thus on the passage Romans 8, 3, God sent his Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, non enum caro peccati erat, quae non de carnale delectatione nata erat, sed tamen inerat ei similitudo carnis peccati, quia mortalis caro erat. Liber octaginta tres questiones. Question 66. 
he also teaches in his work entitled opus imperfectum one forty seven that inherited sin is both sin and punishment at once it is already present in newborn children but only shows itself if they grow up yet the origin of this sin is to be referred to the will of the sinner this sinner was adam but we all existed in him adam became miserable and in him we have all become miserable certainly the doctrine of original sin assertion of the will and of salvation denial of the will is the great truth which constitutes the essence of christianity while most of what remains is only the clothing of it the husk or accessories therefore jesus christ ought always to be conceived in the universal as the symbol or personification of the denial of the will to live but never as an individual whether according to his mythical history given in the gospels or according to the probably true history which lies at the foundation of this for neither the one nor the other will easily satisfy us entirely it is merely the vehicle of that conception for the people who always demand something actual that in recent times christianity has forgotten its true significance and degenerated into dull optimism does not concern us here it is further an original and evangelical doctrine of christianity which augustine with the consent of the leaders of the church defended against the platitudes of the pelagians and which it was the principal aim of luther's endeavour to purify from error and re-establish as he expressly declares in his book de servo arbitrio the doctrine that the will is not free but originally subject to the inclination to evil therefore according to this doctrine the deeds of the will are always sinful and imperfect and can never fully satisfy justice and finally these works can never save us but faith alone a faith which itself does not spring from resolution and free will but from the work of grace without our cooperation comes to us as from without not only the dogmas referred to before but also this last genuine evangelical dogma belongs to those which at the present day an ignorant and dull opinion rejects as absurd or hides for in spite of augustine and luther it adheres to the vulgar pelagianism which the rationalism of the day really is and treats as antiquated those deeply significant dogmas which are peculiar and essential to christianity in the strictest sense while on the other hand it holds fast and regards as the principal matter only the dogma that originates in judaism and has been retained from it and is merely historically connected with christianity we however recognize in the doctrine referred to above the truth completely agreeing with the result of our own investigations we see that true virtue and holiness of disposition have their origin not in deliberate choice works but in knowledge faith just as we have in like manner developed it from our leading thought if it were works which spring from motives and deliberate intention that led to salvation then however one may turn it virtue would always be a prudent methodical far-seeing egoism but the faith to which the christian church promises salvation is this that as through the fall of the first man we are all partakers of sin and subject to death and perdition through the divine substitute through grace and the taking upon himself of our fearful guilt we are all saved without any merit of our own 
of the person since that which can proceed from the intentional determined by motives action of the person works can never justify us from its very nature just because it is intentional action induced by motives opus operatum thus in this faith there is implied first of all that our condition is originally and essentially an incurable one from which we need salvation then that we ourselves essentially belong to evil and are so firmly bound to it that our works according to law and precept i e according to motives can never satisfy justice nor save us but salvation is only obtained through faith i e through a changed mode of knowing and this faith can only come through grace thus as from without this means that the salvation is one which is quite foreign to our person and points to a denial and surrender of this person necessary to salvation works the result of the law as such can never justify because they are always action following upon motives luther demands in his book de libertate christiana that after the entrance of faith the good works shall proceed from it entirely of themselves as symptoms as fruits of it yet by no means as constituting in themselves a claim to merit justification or reward but taking place quite voluntarily and gratuitously so we also hold that from the ever clearer penetration of the principium individuationis proceeds first merely free justice then love extending to the complete abolition of egoism and finally resignation or denial of the will i have here introduced these dogmas of christian theology which in themselves are foreign to philosophy merely for the purpose of showing that the ethical doctrine which proceeds from our whole investigation and is in complete agreement and connection with all its parts although new and unprecedented in its expression is by no means so in its real nature but fully agrees with the christian dogmas properly so called and indeed as regards its essence was contained and present in them it also agrees quite as accurately with the doctrines and ethical teachings of the sacred books of india which in their turn are presented in quite different forms at the same time the calling to mind of the dogmas of the christian church serves to explain and illustrate the apparent contradiction between the necessity of all expressions of character when motives are presented the kingdom of nature on the one hand and the freedom of the will in itself to deny itself and abolish the character with all the necessity of the motives based upon it the kingdom of grace on the other hand end of fourth book the world as will sections sixty nine and seventy section forty four of the world as well an idea this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by Paul gonzalez the world as well an idea volume one by arthur schopenhauer translated by r b haldane and j kempt section forty four I now end the general account of ethics, and with it the whole development which it has been my object to impart, and I by no means desire to conceal here an objection which concerns this last part of my exposition, 
but rather to point out that it lies in the nature of the question, and that it is quite impossible to remove it. It is this, that after our investigation has brought us to the point at which we have before our eyes perfect holiness, the denial and surrender of all volition, and thus deliverance from a world whose whole existence we have found to be suffering, this appears to us as it passing away into empty nothingness. On this I must first remark that the conception of nothing is essentially relative, and always refers to a definite something which in negatives. This quality has been attributed by Kant merely to the nihil privativum, which is indicated by, as opposed to, positive, which is negative, from an opposite point of view much become positive, and in opposition to this nihil privativum, the nihil negativum, has been set up, which would in every reference be nothing, and as an example of this the logical contradiction which does away with itself has been given. But more closely considered, no absolute nothing, no proper nihil negativum, is even thinkable. But everything of this kind, when considered from higher standpoint and subsurn under a wider concept, is always merely a nihil privativum. Every nothing is thought as such only in relation to something, and presupposes this relation, and thus also this something. Even the logical contradiction is only a relative nothing. It is no thought of the reason, but is not on that account an absolute nothing, for it is a combination of words. It is an example of the unthinkable, which is necessary in logic in order to prove the laws of thought. Therefore, if for this end such an example is sought, we will stick to the nonsense of positive, which we are in search of, and pass over the sense of the negative. Thus every nihil negativum, if subordinated to a higher concept, will appear as a mere nihil privativum, or relative nothing, which can, moreover, always exchange signs with awarded negatives, so that that would then be thought as negation, and in itself as assertion. This also agrees to the result of the difficult dialectical investigation of the meaning of nothing which Plato gives in a sophist, page 277-287. Din to etero fisin apothixandes, o sante, que cataca kermatis menin, epipanda ta onda prosalida, to prostohone castumorio aftis anditi themenon, etol misamen epin, o safto to tu estim, ondos to millon. Cum enim ostenderemus alterius ipsius naturam, esse perque omnia entia divisam atque dispersam in vicem, tung partem eius oppositam e quod cuiusque es ipsum rivera non ens aceruimus. That is generally received as positive, which we call the real, and the negation of which the concept nothing in its most general significance expresses, is just the world as idea, which I have shown to be the objectivity and mirror of the will. Moreover, we ourselves are just this will and this world, and to them belongs the idea in general, as an aspect of them. The form of the idea is space and time. Therefore, for this point of view, all that is real must be in some place and at some time. Denial, abolition, conversion of the will, is also the abolition and vanishing of the world, its mirror. If we no longer perceive it in this mirror, we ask in vain where it has gone, and then, because it is no longer anywhere and when, complain that it has vanished into nothing. A reverse point of view, if it were possible for us, would reverse the signs and show the real first as nothing, and that nothing as the real. But as long as we ourselves are the real to leave, this last, nothing as the real, can only be known as signified most negatively, because the old saying of Empedocles, that like only can be known by like, deprive us here of all knowledge, as, conversely, upon it finally rests the possibility of all our actual knowledge, i.e., the world as idea, for the world is self-knowledge of the will. If, however, it should be absolutely insisted upon that in some way or other positive knowledge should be attained of that which philosophy can only express negatively as a denial of the will, that there would be nothing for it but to refer to the state which all those who have attained to complete denial of the will have experienced, and which has been variously denoted by the name ecstasy, rapture, illumination, union with God, 
and so forth, a state, however, which cannot properly be called knowledge, because it is not to form subject and object, and is, moreover, only attainable in one's own experience, and cannot be further communicated. We, however, who consistently occupy the standpoint of philosophy, must be satisfied here with a negative knowledge, content to have reached the utmost limit of positive. We have recognized the inmost nature of the world as will, and all its phenomena, as only the objectivity of will, and we have followed this objectivity from the unconscious working of obscure forces of nature, up to the completely conscious action of man. Therefore we shall by no means evade the consequence, that with a free denial, the surrender of the will, all of those phenomena are also abolished, that constant strain and effort without end, and without rest at all the grace of activity, in which and through which the world consists, the multifarious forms exceeding each other in gradation, the whole manifestation of the will, and, finally, also universal forms of manifestation, time and space, and, also, its last fundamental form, subject and object, are all abolished, no will, no idea, no world. Before us there is certainly only nothingness, but that which resists is passing into nothing, our nature, our nature is indeed just the will to live, which we ourselves are, as it is our world. That we abhor annihilation so greatly is simply another expression of the fact that we so extremely will life, and are nothing but this will, and know nothing besides it. And if we turn our glance from our own needy and imbalanced condition to those who have overcome the world, in whom the will having attained to perfect self-knowledge, found itself again in all, and then freely denied itself, and who then merely wait to see the last trace of its vanish with the body which it animates, then instead of the restless striving and effort, instead of a constant transition from wish to fruition, and from joy to sorrow, instead of the never satisfied and never dying hope which constitutes the life of the man who wills, we shall see that peace which is above all reason, that perfect calm to spirit, that deep rest, that inviolable confidence and serenity, the mere reflection of which in the countenance, as Raphael and Correggio have represented it, is an entire and certain gospel, only knowledge remains, the will has vanished. We look with deep and painful longing upon this state, beside which the misery and wretchedness of our own is brought out by clearly by the contrast. Yet this is the only consideration which can afford us lasting consolation, when, on the one hand, we have recognized incurable suffering and endless misery as essential manifestation of will, the world, and, on the other hand, see the world pass away with the abolition of will, and retain before us only empty nothingness. Thus, in this way, by contemplation of the life and conduct of saints, whom it is certainly rarely granted us to meet with our own experience, but who are brought before our eyes by written history, and with the stamp of inner truth, by art, we must banish a dark impression of that nothingness which we discern behind all virtue and holiness as their final goal, and which we fear as children fear the dark. We must not even evade it like the Indians, through myths and meaningless words, such as reabsorption in Brahma or the Nirvana of the Buddhist. Rather, do we freely acknowledge that what remains after the entire abolition of will is for all those who are still full of will certainly nothing, but, conversely, to those in whom the will has turned and has united itself, this our world, which is so real, with all its suns and milky ways, is nothing. End of section 44 and End of the World as Will and Idea, Volume 1, by Arthur Schopenhauer, translated by R. B. Haldane and J. Kemp. Recording by Phil Gonzalez in Cavite, Philippines.